diligent in um, seeing how they respond to our message and then responding back to them. So um, it, I personally really like it. They seem really annoyed we're there, which is really fun. Um, so I'm going to make the bold assumption here that I have the majority of the audience on face value thinking, you know, these kind of totalitarian tactics, you know, aren't the greatest idea. I'm just going to make that assumption. But I'm going to try to go expand upon that to let you know why this is even worse of an idea than you think. Why it's even more effective and more counterproductive and actually very harmful to students. Um, first of all, drug testing isn't effective. Um, the assumption ideologically out there often accompanying this is that, oh, drug testing works, you know. Students will know they're going to be tested, they're going to stop, you know, experimenting. But it, it doesn't work that way. Um, behavior isn't that simple, and drug testing, um, you know, isn't that effective. Um, the only study um, that looked at this nationally was funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, was done by the researchers who conduct the Monitoring the Future study, so very respected. And they looked at 76,000 students nationwide in schools with and without drug testing and found no difference in the rates of student drug use. Of course, the White House thought this study was not so great. They didn't like it, so they attacked it. Uh, and then these researchers, they did a follow-up study. And they, looked at, um, they looked at random drug testing even more closely, and they found the same results. Um, what the White House does at these summits is they present their research, and they say, you know, this is solid evidence that drug testing is working in schools. It's not research, really. Most of it isn't published in peer-reviewed um, articles. Um, the majority of it is done by either ideologically motivated educators who are, you know, gung-ho about this policy um, and have done their own little report, which they call a study, saying that it works. Um, otherwise, it's basically mostly based on anecdotal evidence. The only study that was peer-reviewed um, was suspended by the federal government for violating um, ethical standards, and it also showed, it was only two schools in the study, which they say showed that drug testing worked. And what it did show is, is that students' attitudes towards drug use became significantly, they became more negative towards school, and their drug risk taking, or r drug risk taking behavior factors went up. So they were, their attitudes, they were actually more at risk uh, of using drugs. So I thought they, of course, never mentioned this at any of the, study, uh, the summits. Um, secondly of all, at the summits, they try to make drug testing sound as wonderful as possible. They say it is 100% accurate, it is 100% confidential, and it is 100% non-punitive, and 100% all about love. Um, in actuality, the kind of drug testing they do is not the kind that, um, that Car Mr. Karch talked about. It is not federally regulated drug testing with GCMS, you know, uh, protocols. It is mostly done with little dipstick tests they do at school. It's the cheapest possible because schools don't have that much money. Um, right, there's no federal guidelines. So they say, oh, you know, there are all these, you know, protocol, the medical review officers. Well, in reality, schools all do it differently. So the little school in Texas, um, where the parent calls me from, and there, there's no chain of custody that's appropriately followed. There's no follow-up testing. They didn't keep the, res the urine like they were supposed to if there was any challenges. They didn't call to see that the student was on medication given by their doctor that would cause a false positive. Um, and so these kind of things happen all the time, but they say, you know, this is, they if it's workplace federally testing, which is, you know, as described, it is fairly reliable, but this is not that kind of drug testing that's done. Um, also, school administrators don't know, they, they don't know a lot about this. There was recently a study done by researchers at Children's Hospital Boston, and it found that most pediatricians uh, don't know the proper uh, protocols for collecting a drug test, for interpreting a drug test, or acting on a drug test. So you can only imagine what school administrators, when they're trying to deal with this, or interpret, you know, what drug testing company to go with, they're having a lot of problems. Um, then in terms of confidentiality, they say these programs are 100% confidential. But the way they do it is, first of all, it's attached to extracurricular activities. So if you're going to participate in 
um, athletics or the chess club or choir, um, you have to agree to submit to random drug testing. And what the punishment is, is if you test positive, you're suspended from the program, which is very counterproductive also because <coughs> keeping students in engaged in activities is really important. But this uh, suspension is rather public. So first of all, you, you're, you're pulled from class for the drug test at random. So everyone in your class notices you're pulled from class for the drug test. And then you're suspended from your after school activity. And so high school being the gossip mill that it is, it's not so hard to put two and two together and realize what <coughs> has happened. And at the last ONDCP summit, a principal acknowledged this issue, said, you know, a parent was concerned about this, and she said, you know, it, you know, that is true. But she said, you know, I really don't care about that if it's about saving the student's life. So confidentiality is promised, but the way it's implemented, it's just not possible. There's also other instances of, you know, various counselors mistakenly leaving out the results on, you know, in the open for people to see. Or in small towns, the information gets around very quickly. Um, and so we've had a lot of students call it concerned about false positives, and then the whole town knows, and the damage has irrevocably, irrevocably been done. Um, if they later, you know, figure out, oh no, it wasn't a real positive, it's still out there. Everyone still believes or has a question in their mind about this. Um, so there's no confidentiality. And then the punitive aspect, they say this is non-punitive. Um, this is, you know, uh, but at the same time, students are suspended from extracurricular activities, and if they don't then jump through all the hoops lined out, it escalates into the end result often of expulsion. So while it may start out, you know, maybe suspending students um, isn't seen as so bad, it, it just gets more progressively more punitive. Um, and it's counterproductive, as I said, to suspend students from these activities. Uh, the programs are expensive. Um, they run, you know, various ranges, 20,000, 40,000. The ONDCP gives out grants, and they run, run upwards of $100,000 to implement these programs. And at the summits, they say that they cost two to $5,000. And they give great recommendations for implementing them, such as hold a bake sale, hold a garage sale. They're totally unrealistic in reality. So, um, so it is, it's just really not in touch with reality. They're, they are very expensive, and the federal government's giving out you know, upwards of $100,000 to implement it know where that disconnect is. Um, there are other reasons they're counterproductive. They can deter students from participating in extracurricular activities, which are one of the only things shown to keep students engaged and away from absolutely difficulties with substance abuse. They break down relationships of trust at school, break down, break down communication. They can create a kind of cat and mouse game where students will try to cheat the test. We've heard of students trying home remedies, things like drinking bleach solutions or iodine to try to change these tests, which is incredibly dangerous um, and counterproductive. Students also, you know, adolescents are rebellious. So they find these programs offensive. They'll do things like stall for hours to produce their urine test, missing class time. Other schools that do hair tests, there have been reports of schools sh students shaving their heads, so there, there's no hair to test. So it, it can just bring out adolescent rebellion. And then there's the parents. Um, a lot of parents find these programs really offensive and counterproductive and feel that their rights to raise their children is really being stepped upon so that this is really the domain of parents to be making these kinds of decisions. Um, just a little bit about what's going on in drug testing. I know I should be probably wrapping up here. Um, but there is a lawsuit going on right now in the state of Washington by the ACLU which is challenging random drug testing on state constitutional grounds. So the state, pri the, the privacy rights in the state constitution are at issue, and so we hope, we hope that that goes well. Um, there's also been, um, they're trying to expand 